All right, well, good morning, church. This is reminiscent of a year ago when we had to close everything down and I was preaching to an empty house. It's not quite an empty house. There's about two, four, six people that are here. But unfortunately, we came in the door this morning and found out that the water had frozen, some frozen pipes, and so we have not been able to hold our regular service. But uh, we decided we wanted to at least uh, give you some music and a message this morning, and so we're going to go ahead and broadcast that much of the service. And so uh, we're thankful to be here and thankful for God's presence. He's here when it's cold and he's here when it's hot and he never leaves and he, he knows what's what, right? So uh, let's begin together with a word of prayer, please. Father, thank you that we can be in your house today and that we can send forth this message on Facebook Live. We pray for those who will be watching that your spirit will move in their hearts and upon their lives. We have so many who are battling with COVID, we have so many who are sick, and we are praying for many in our church family, that you will meet them in their time of testing, their time of trial, and bring healing and bring help to them. And Father, we're grateful for your love and your faithfulness. Bless us now as we pray name. Amen. I'm going to ask my good friend Wayne Meadow to come and share a song that he's been preparing for this morning. We're grateful that you stuck around, brother. Thank you, Pastor. It's so nice to be here this morning. Cold weather, frozen pipes, or whatever. But uh, I'm going to do a song for you that goes back to, I believe, the 70s or the 80s. And it's really a different song, but it's got a powerful message. And the message is for those of us who sometime in our walk with the Lord have kind of maybe uh, grown a little bit cold or indifferent. But I was thinking this morning, and Carol and I were talking about what's gone on with COVID-19 for this, oh, we're into the third year now. And it's instilled a lot of fear in people. And I believe that it's really driven people, some people, away from the Lord, or it's just uh, been a terrible time. But good times are coming. And the Lord is going to bring back the new again. There is a band. Back the new again. 
stalemate thing old And I've lost the happy song I used to sing I guess that I forgot the most important thing But I don't want this callous feeling anymore Amen. Thank you, brother. That's a good song. Those days when we were newly saved and our faith was brand new and we were in love with the Lord, boy, we need the Lord to help us to stay right there in that joy. Amen? Walking in the joy of the Lord. I really like the saxophones in that song, let me just say. You figured I would, yeah. A saxophone man from way back, that's me. So uh, beautiful, beautiful music. Thank you so much. I want to continue uh, in this series we've been doing in the, the Gospel of Matthew, and uh, today we're in chapter 16, and we'll be sharing verses 13 to 20. Well, you may have heard about the lifelong atheist who was found reading his Bible as he lay dying. A friend of his came and asked him, he said, hey, what are you doing? What are you doing reading the Bible? He said, I'm looking for loopholes. Well, you know, by living in a daily relationship with Jesus Christ, we won't have to look up with his disciples. Jesus to establish his kingdom. But notice that Jesus has not come to establish his kingdom, not at this time. This is not the hour for that. Rather, this is the time that he has come to build his church. And so notice the question that Jesus is asking his disciples. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? So let's take a look at the answers Jesus gets to his question. Verse 14. They replied, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Now you might remember that King Herod had had John the Baptist beheaded. And I believe it was the guilt that was riddling Herod that made him say that maybe Jesus was actually John the Baptist who then resurrected from the dead. And no doubt him saying that influenced other people, and they began to wonder if that might be true. And then there were some who thought that Jesus might be Elijah the prophet who had returned. And this, of course, would fulfill the last words of the prophet Malachi from the last book of the Old Testament. It ends with these statements, Malachi 4, 5. See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. 
And so some saw the power and the miracles of Jesus' ministry and wondered, is this Elijah? But Jesus declared that he was not Elijah. That would actually be his cousin, John the Baptist. And in fact, Jesus will confirm this in the next chapter when we get there. In Matthew 17, Jesus will make this statement, but I tell you, Elijah has already come. And they did not recognize him, but have done to him everything they wished. In the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. And so Elijah, Jesus says, was John the Baptist who came. And, and just as John was killed for his faith, so Jesus will also be killed for the gospel message. And then, of course, the third answer that Jesus receives from his disciples is that some believe that he had this tender heart, much like Jeremiah the prophet, who wept over Israel and Jerusalem. We remember that Jesus wept over Jerusalem, wanting her to come to the Lord, but she wouldn't do it. But Jesus, you see, was none of those. But notice that Jesus now presses his followers for an answer. You see, what this was really about for Jesus is not what everybody else thinks of him. It's not who they think he is. He wants to know, what do you believe about me? What do my disciples believe? Who do you say I am? You see, how you operate under the Lordship of Jesus Christ is going to be directly related to who you think he is. And so just as Jesus asked his disciples 2,000 years ago, my friend, he's also asking you and I today, who do you say that I am? There was a shopkeeper who was looking for some help, and so he posted a sign in his store window. And the sign simply said, boy wanted. Well, the young men in town saw the sign, and saw this possible employment, and they were all talking about it, but it was young John Simmons who decided to respond to the sign in the window, and so he came and went into the shop, and, and the problem with John was that John was kind of a lazy fellow, but he saw his opportunity and applied anyway. Well, he was quickly hired, of course, by the proprietor, Mr. Peters, and because the pace at the store was more leisurely, John was enjoying it. He didn't have to do too much work. But then toward the middle of the afternoon, Mr. Peters sent him up to the attic, which was a dingy place that was filled with cobwebs and infested with mice. You will find a deep box there, explained Mr. Peters. Please sort out the contents and see what should be saved. Well, John was disappointed. It was a very large container, and there seemed to be nothing in it but old junk. Well, after a few minutes, he went back down to the ground floor. When he was asked by the proprietor if he had completed his work, he simply said, No, sir, it was dark and cold up there, and I didn't think it was worth doing. And so at closing time, young John was paid for his day's work and told not to return. Well, the next morning, the same sign was in the window, boy wanted, and Crawford Hill was the next one to answer and be employed. But when he was sent upstairs to tidy up the same box, Crawford spent hours sorting through all of the contents separating the usable nails and screws from the things to be discarded. Suddenly he raced down the stairs all excited. At the very bottom he said, I found this, holding up a $20 bill. Well, at last the store owner had discovered a conscientious boy to whom he could entrust his business when he retired. Years later, Mr. Peters said of Crawford, he said, this young man, who is now my successor, found his fortune in a junk box. But then correcting himself, he also added this. He said, no, he said, actually, he found it in his mother's Bible because he took to heart the verse that she made him memorize years ago. 
Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. Well, Jesus was going to be leaving earth to return to heaven following his resurrection. And so he was wanting to pass things on to his disciples. His time was spent preparing them for all of the responsibilities that would follow. He had to know that they accepted his authority as Lord before he could entrust to them the keys of the kingdom. And so notice that he asked this same question of his disciples. Verse 15, but what about you, he asked, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. Now let's think about this for a minute. I want you to notice with me that this was not the first time that people had recognized Jesus as the Messiah. When we read in John chapter 1, we read there that Nathanael confessed Jesus Christ as Lord. In Matthew chapter 14, the disciples declared Jesus to be the Son of God after he stilled the storm. In John chapter 6, Peter declared uh, Peter declared Jesus to be the Holy One from God after Jesus had given his sermon on the bread of life. And after Jesus called Andrew to follow him, the very first thing Andrew did was to go and get his brother Philip and say to him, we have found the Christ, the Messiah. So what was it about this confession by Peter that made it different? Well, first of all, this confession did not follow some miracle that had been done by Christ. He simply sprung the question on him. Therefore, it was not some emotional response in the moment. Let me just say that I have seen people make emotional responses to Christ, responses that never lasted more than a day. The next day it meant nothing at all to them. It was nothing more than an emotional reaction in the moment. But how many of you know that when Jesus Christ becomes Lord of your life, your life is now under new management. All things pass away and all things become new. You need to be more than a professor simply professing your faith. Your practice needs to follow your profession. Your walk needs to be in line with your talk. And so secondly, this statement, notice that it was a direct response to Jesus' question. He was answering because Jesus asked him. One commentator called Peter's confession, quote, the studied and sincere statement of a man who had been taught by God, end quote. So Peter wasn't being emotional here. He was speaking the truth, the truth that he had learned, that he had come to believe with all of his heart about Jesus Christ. And then Jesus makes a very interesting comment. In fact, it's one that's been misunderstood for centuries by the Christian church. Look at it with me, verse number 18. And I tell you that you are Peter will not overcome it. Now there are two different Greek words that are being used in this sentence by Jesus Christ. He begins by saying, I tell you that you are Peter. The word is Petros, and it means a pebble or a small stone. You are a small stone. You're Petros, you're Peter. But when Jesus says, and on this rock, he uses the word Petra, and Petra means a large stone. And so, in essence, uh, Jesus Christ is the large stone over against Peter, who is the small stone. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of the church, and the church is built on the authority of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus is saying, in essence, Peter, you're a tiny stone who has spoken a mountain of truth. And upon this mountain of truth, this cornerstone, I will build my church. 
My friend, let me be clear that Jesus Christ would never entrust his church to be founded upon something or someone as weak as sinful human beings. I'm thankful that Jesus Christ himself is the cornerstone and the head of his church, and as he has said, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And of course, Peter would later explain in his epistle that we as believers are the living stones, those Petros is being built into God's temple called the church. All right, then Jesus goes on and makes another controversial statement. Look, at, look with me at verse 19. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now this is another passage that's been misunderstood through the centuries. On its face, it would seem that God is saying to Peter and to the disciples that whatever they forbid on earth, that heaven will also follow suit and forbid in heaven. And whatever the disciples allow or permit on earth, that heaven will then follow suit and permit it also there. But you see, that's backwards. The expanded translation by Greek scholar Kenneth Weiss brings the correct interpretation. Listen closely. And whatever you bind on earth or forbid to be done shall have been already bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth, whatever you permit to be done on earth, shall have already been loosed in heaven. Jesus never said that you guys have the authority and whatever you say, heaven will follow suit. He did not give the authority for God to obey the disciples, but rather the disciples were going to obey the Spirit of God and what he was telling them to do. Jesus is saying that the Holy Spirit working through the disciples will guide them to do all things according to God's wisdom sent down from heaven. We just prayed it in the, the first service. We, had, we were able to have a full service there. We said the Lord's Prayer. And part of the Lord's Prayer has the proper arrangement of this. It says, Thy will uh, be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that is the same thought here. As God has decreed it in heaven, so His Spirit will work through the disciples to walk in obedience to that word. God sets the rules. Human beings are called to follow the rules. Amen? Verse number 20. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Now why is it that Jesus would want to keep that a secret? Shouldn't he want to tell the whole world that he's the Messiah, that he's here? Well, I think there's two reasons why Jesus tells them this. Number one. Jesus knows the commotion and the crowds that are going to come if they go around broadcasting he's the Messiah. Why, as crazy as it is now, it's going to get even crazier when people start flocking to him. And secondly, Jesus knows that the crowds have only one thing on their mind. When the Messiah comes, they want the kingdom now. And Jesus knows this is not the time for the kingdom. And so he gives a word of caution to his disciples. Don't go telling everybody I'm the Messiah. It's going to create even more chaos. A man by the name of Bill Broadhurst was a runner. And he entered a 10K race in Omaha. It was a race that another runner by the name of Bill Rogers would enter and win in less than 30 minutes. But Bill Broadhurst had a handicap. He was paralyzed on his entire left side from an aneurysm he had as a boy. But he still loved to run, and for him to be in the same race as his hero, Bill Rogers, why, that was the greatest thing that he could imagine. So after the race, the banners had been taken down. The traffic had begun to flow on the roads. There was nothing left that would tell you that a race 
had been run, except that a man by the name of Bill Broadhurst was still running. Two hours ago, Bill Rogers had won the race, but now Bill Broadhurst was finally nearing the place where the finish line was. A couple of kids on bikes rode up beside him, and they said, hey, mister, are you still running the race? It's been over for hours. Someone's already finished first and won. Why don't you quit? The race is over. Broadhurst replied, I can't. I have to make it to my hero at the end of the line. And he kept on running. As he approached the place where he knew the finish line would be, Bill Rogers, along with about 30 others, stepped out from an alley and set up a banner and strung a ribbon across the road. And Bill Broadhurst stumbled across that finish line and there stood his hero, Bill Rogers, who took off the ribbon from his neck placed it around the neck of Broadhurst. He said, my friend, you are a winner because you never quit. Brothers and sisters, we cannot afford to quit. I know we've had so many setbacks. We've had sickness. We've had discouragement. We've had ice storm last week that closed church. We've had frozen pipes this week to close church. We've had setbacks, we've had heartbreaks, and we've even faced death. But my friends, we must keep on running. Our hero finished this race 2,000 years ago. But he's waiting for us. And yes, he knows that we're handicapped. We're handicapped by our sin. We're handicapped by our indecisiveness. We are handicapped by attacks from the enemy. But my friend, your hero, Jesus Christ, is at the finish line waiting to give you the victor's crown of life. So don't you dare Let's pray together. Father, on this day when there is so much that is coming against your church, we have inclement weather that is making trouble. We have mandates from the government. We are being told that it's not safe, you shouldn't be meeting. We're told that if you do meet, you have to do all these things. And we feel frustrated and we feel like we don't understand why it has to be this way. But Father, when all of these attacks come and when all of this opposition rises up against your church, we ask you to remind us that we're right on track with you. Just as our Savior was opposed by so many different things, from government problems to political problems to religious elites, so will the Church of Jesus in this day be opposed by many different factors. But this is what you have told us. You have said that you're the one who never fails. You have said that you're the one who will give us the victory and the victor's crown of life when this race is complete. And the Bible still says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that you are the God who does not change. And so, Father, my prayer is for the church of Jesus Christ in this hour. I pray for those who do not know Christ today. They've never opened their heart and ask Christ to forgive their sin and come into their life. 
Father, show them that they are separated from you. And their separation now is nothing compared to what that separation will mean eternally. When there will be damnation, when there will be judgment from God, the Bible is very clear. And while they're, they are free to make all the choices they want and enter in and do all the things they would like to do now, they will not have those freedoms when they pass before the judgment seat of God. So my friend, if you are listening today and you've never opened your heart to Jesus Christ, I'm going to ask you to pause and think for a moment. Jesus requires it of all people. Who do you say I am? And if you will name Christ as Savior and Lord and bow the knee to Him and walk in obedience to His will, there is a heaven awaiting you, a place with glory and majesty so great that the human mind cannot even understand it. The Bible tells us clearly that the, the mind has not seen, the eye has not seen, the ear has never heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Do you want that to be your eternity? Or do you want the eternity that the Bible says is a place of darkness, where there is fire, where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth? God presents the path before us, and he says, you choose. Choose you this day. Who do you say I am? And today, if you will turn to Christ with all of your heart, he is waiting for you. He wants to come into your heart to forgive your sins and to give you a brand new life. Jesus said, if you come to me this way, you will be born again, born from above, with a brand new start, with a brand new life, and with all of your sins forgiven and cleansed. My friend, it's your choice today which one you choose, and Christ is waiting for you. He wants to give you, at the end of this race of life, the victor's crown. Will you receive it? Will you allow Christ to come into your life? If you would, I invite you to pray this prayer after me and just say these words to the Lord and he will hear you. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me for my sins. I am a sinner and I am not deserving of your heaven. But I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me and I want to be saved from my own sin. Lord, forgive me and come into my heart and help me to believe your word and live my life for you. I ask it in Christ's holy name. Amen. And Father, for any that prayed that prayer, give them this day an assurance that they have been heard and that whether they feel anything different or nothing different, it's a contract you've entered into with them. And so, my friend, there's great joy ahead. And the one thing that God asks of us is that we simply do not quit, but stay faithful in this race. May God bless you. This has been our service today, a little different than normal, but it's still a service where we've been together, the presence of God has been here, and the Lord is still ministering to us. So God bless you, and have a great Sunday.